This, this, these, this is my childhood Commodore 1084S. And after repairing two catastrophic failures, it's broken yet again. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 109 of Retro Bits. I've had this monitor since the late 80s when I bought a used Commodore 128 from a member of a local BBS. It died completely around the year 2000 and then sat tucked away in various closets for the next two decades. When I got sucked into the world of retro computers about five years ago now, I decided to see if I could fix the 1084S, so I diagnosed and replaced a failed flyback transformer and horizontal output transistor. While it was a part, I also replaced all of the original capacitors. That got the monitor back up and running again, at least for a while, until the deflection yoke shorted out while I was in the middle of filming a video about the 1084S itself. It turned out that there was a catastrophic amount of corrosion in the windings where the magnet wire's insulation had failed. With the yoke severely damaged, I swapped the entire tube assembly from a spare monitor to get mine back up and running again. But right away, it developed an entirely new issue. So here's the current situation. When connected to any type of RGB source, analog or digital, the picture looks great. The image is sharp and clear, and the colors are vivid. However, when used with a composite or split lumachroma source, such as the C64, everything is pink. I mean, really, really pink. It can't be a problem with the tube or electron guns because RGB is fine, so I'm thinking it must be related to the NTSC color decoding circuit. Now, apparently, I don't know when to call it quits, so let's set the sunk cost fallacy aside for a moment and jump right in. Again. Before we can effectively troubleshoot, let's take a moment to review how NTSC Color works. Named after the National Television Standards Committee, this analog television broadcast specification is a fascinating case study in engineering creativity. In 1953, a method was approved that allowed color information to be inserted inside the existing signal standard from 12 years prior, allowing the format to work with new color televisions without breaking compatibility on older black and white sets. In the original monochrome standard, only brightness or luminance information is present in the signal. If we look at a single scan line from this C64 screen, we can see distinctly different levels of brightness in each of the bars as we travel from left to right. And here's what the signal looks like for that single scan line. Each starts with synchronization and reference information. After that, we can see each distinct area of brightness in the source image represented as a change in amplitude over time. Here's the same C64 screen as before, now in glorious 16 colors. Once again, let's look at the scope capture of a single scan line. As before, we still see brightness as changes in amplitude. This area represents the black border and first color bar. Next to it is the block of white. Color is achieved by injecting the original black and white signal with additional sine waves that contain the chrominant subcarrier, or color burst, along with amplitude modulated saturation and phase modulated hue. This one is red, or the thing that the C64 calls red anyway. This is an oversimplification of how NTSC color works, and the subject could be an entire series all by itself, but we need to get to fixing things. A quick word about the PAL standard first, though. It employs an almost identical system as NTSC, but as its name suggests, phase alternating line differs in that the color phase information is inverted from line to line in order to achieve more consistent hue reproduction, with reduced color detail being the trade-off. Early on, it was found that NTSC broadcasts could suffer from transmission errors and signal reflections that resulted in changes to the phase angle between the source and receiver. These phase shifts subsequently affected color reproduction something PAL's alternating system automatically compensates for. This is why NTSC displays have a hue, or tint adjustment, where PAL models do not. It's also why NTSC is often referred to as never twice the same color, or never the same color for short. So back to my broken 1084S. At first I thought maybe the hue was simply out of adjustment, I quickly discovered that varying the setting didn't cause any change to the image at all. 
Adjusting the knob on a good working monitor demonstrates the range of adjustment available and what we should be seeing on the broken display. This seems like a good place to start troubleshooting, so I do believe it's time to cue the music. Alright, here is the main board of the 1084S, and down here is the trim pot that would normally allow us to adjust the hue, but isn't working. To understand how this is supposed to operate, we need to learn a little bit about this chip here, the TDA4570 NTSC decoder. The 4570 handles all of the signal demodulating for NTSC sources and generates the output stage that's fed into a 3505 video control chip. This other IC ingests both the raw RGB input as well as the demodulated NTSC signal and generates the output that drives the electron guns in the picture tube, and it appears to be working fine. The 4570, on the other hand, is responsible for hue control on pin 11 as indicated here. If we look at the schematic in the datasheet, there's a network of resistors and a potentiometer that are configured to provide a precise range of voltages to pin 11. Hue adjustment is realized by offsetting the phase angle of the modulated color information by plus or minus 30 degrees. The 1084S service manual shows how the 4570 chip is implemented in this specific application. We can see that the resistor network and trim pot are provisioned per the datasheet, although the resistor values here are slightly different. Full disclosure, this isn't the first time I've worked on this issue. When it first started displaying only pink a few years ago, I performed a few cursory tests, including desoldering and testing each of the resistors in the Hue network along with the decoupling capacitor. I also socketed and replaced the 4570 and 3505 chips as they're both still available new and only a couple dollars a piece. I didn't know as much about troubleshooting back then, so I was just going after the low hanging fruit to see if the fix was something easy. It wasn't. Armed with a few more years of experience, let's be a bit smarter this time and perform some proper testing. First, I'll connect my multimeter up to the output of the potentiometer and see if we can vary the resistance. Hmm, that's odd. It goes from roughly 0 to 2.5k to just under 1 kilo ohm as I turn the knob counterclockwise from stop to stop. I would have expected a linear response. It doesn't seem right to me, but this isn't exactly a conclusive test. What we really want is to see what voltages are present when the monitor is running. I really don't want to reach in there with live voltage present, so I'll connect up a probe by lifting the chip and attaching it to the leg of pin 11. Good thing I installed the socket previously. All right, got the monitor back together in less than five minutes. This thing is so easy compared to the NEC multisyncs I've been working on lately. With the multimeter set to measure DC voltage, let's see what's going on with the hue input to the 4570 chip. Huh, I'm seeing 0.1 volts on the low end to 0.6 volts on the high end across the entire adjustment range of the trim pot. It's pretty linear this time, so I'm going to disregard the prior test. I really feel like these numbers are far too low, but guessing isn't going to help, so let's find out for sure. In order to determine the range of voltages we should really be seeing at pin 11, I made a model of the resistor network. Here's the 10k ohm trim pot, and here's where we'll take our measurement. I'll set up the simulation to measure the voltage sweep for the full range of the pot in 10% increments. 
This graph shows what the 4570 chip should be seeing at the Hue input. It looks like a nice linear rise from 1 to 5 volts across the entire range of adjustment. That's definitely not what we saw when we tested, so something is absolutely going on here. Looking at the datasheet again, there's a note about this service switch function where pin 11 can either be pulled to ground or to plus 12 volts. According to the document, if less than 1 volt or more than 5 volts is present on the pin, it'll disable hue control entirely to allow for adjustment of the reference oscillator or observation of the output signal. Since we measured less than 1 volt through the entire range of the trim pot, it appears that the chip will always be operating in service mode, which can't be a good thing. Since all the passives tested that okay and it's not the chip, there's really nothing else it could be but the potentiometer itself, right? The only way to know for sure is to remove it from the circuit and test it in isolation. According to the schematic, this should be a 10 kilo ohm pot. I'll connect my probes to the two outermost legs, which should give us the rated resistance. Okay, that's good, but what we really want to know is if the variable resistance coming out of the wiper is correct, so I'll move the probe to the middle pin. Hmm, I'm seeing a nice linear response from 0 all the way up to 10k. This trim pot seems to be working fine. In fact, all of the components in the Hue control circuit seem to be in good order. What now? Well, I managed to get the monitor set up in a reasonably good service position where I can operate it while disassembled. What I want to see is whether or not the plus 12 volt rail is actually good, so I've got my probes attached accordingly. If the voltage isn't correct going in, it certainly won't be correct coming out of the Hue control circuit, regardless of whether all the components are good or not. Okay, yeah, looks fine. Not a problem with voltage regulation then. What else could it be? At this point, I'm fairly certain that the Hue control circuit feeding pin 11 is fine. We've now got to consider the possibility that something else is affecting the chip and causing the voltage to be pulled low on the pin. I'll try and rule out some of the other possibilities, starting with the chroma input on pin 9. According to the service manual, the chroma, or color signal, should measure between 10 and 400 millivolts peak to peak. If the signal is bad, it might explain why we're seeing too much of one color. I've got peak to peak voltage measurement turned on and have paused the scope capture to get a better look. This part of the waveform is where the highest amplitude occurs and it seems to be within the specified range, so I don't think there's anything to worry about here. Another important input we need to consider is pin 13. Here, we'll find a crystal oscillator that provides the reference timing needed by the chip to demodulate the color information in the signal. Per the NTSC specification, the color subcarrier is 3.58 MHz. Our crystal operates at 7.16, and the 4570 chip has a built-in 2 to 1 frequency divider. Okay, that is definitely 100% not correct. We're measuring more than twice the frequency that we should be seeing. This would certainly explain why our color decoding isn't working correctly. I think we found our smoking gun. On the right is the main board from my parts 1084 that I previously stole the tube and yoke from. This board ran when parked, so the components should be fine, and the plan is to borrow the crystal from here and transplant it here. As indicated on the part itself, this is definitely a 7.16 MHz crystal. Let's get it installed and wrap this thing up. What do you think? Is this going to work? Should we just send it? Of course we should, and of course it is. Or not. Well, if it's not the crystal itself, there's only one other component that could affect the frequency, and that's this variable capacitor C567 here. 
As before, I'll remove the part from the spare board and install it in the 1084S. Okay, here we go again. This is definitely it this time, right? Right? Balls. Okay, so where does that leave us? If it's not the crystal or the variable capacitor, perhaps it's a passive component attached to one of the other pins of the chip that's affecting the oscillator? I'm grasping at straws now, but all of these lines connect to functional areas of the 4570 that directly or indirectly affect color decoding and hue control, so I tested them all, you know, just in case. And what did I find? So, what now? Well, after exhausting all other avenues, I thought I'd try lifting the hue control pin from the socket to see if that made any difference. It didn't. So, why not remove the chip entirely? You know, for science. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. With the chip removed, we have the exact same situation as before. With no color decoding, we can still see a bit of the Luma signal from the C64 startup screen in the upper left corner. This tells me we've been barking up the wrong tree this whole time. Remember, I previously tried swapping in a new 4570, so it's not the chip that's bad. What else could be preventing the chip from working? Well, maybe it's not getting good power. We already verified that the plus 12 volt rail was good, but I hooked up my meter to pin 7 and measured, and you guessed it, 0 volts. Working my way backwards across the board from pin 7 and testing everything along the path, I came to this resistor, R562. Now, it's supposed to measure 4.7 ohms. Well, it was supposed to, but check this out. The resistor is completely blown out in the middle. It won't come as a surprise to anyone, but it now has infinite resistance, which, check my math, is higher than 4.7. Once again, I've turned to the parts monitor and pilfered a replacement that hopefully still has its magic smoke inside. Alright, moment of truth. After two years, three attempted repairs, and over a dozen hours trying to identify the root cause of the pink screen, could it really be as simple as a single bad resistor? Haha, <laughs> I can't believe it. Well. That's just life in the retro hobby, isn't it? Well, I guess that makes sense. With no power to the chip, all the other measurements we took were basically meaningless. We got there in the end though, and I couldn't be happier with the result. With a full recap, new flyback, a pristine deflection yoke, RGB SCART upgrade, and now working NTSC color, this 1084S is just about the most versatile 15kHz display you could ask for. That said, I've still got more in store for this CRT coming up, so don't forget to subscribe. Well, that was quite an adventure. My childhood 1084S is fully operational again, but for how long is anyone's guess. I love this monitor when it works, but man does this relationship have its ups and downs. I wanted to give a quick shout out to Mark at the Retro Channel for helping me with the troubleshooting and also just listening to me ramble. He's done a lot of videos on the 1084 as well, so check out his channel if you haven't already. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.